I am a professor of sociology at Stanford University. My research, I mean, I have spent my whole career uh, studying social movements, broadly defined, but with a real emphasis on sort of American racial politics and African American sort of liberation struggles. So, um, that, that's been most of the work that I've done. And because I've done so much work on a, a sort of a, a American race relations, American politi racial politics, uh, when the protests, sort of the recent protests popped up in your city, triggered by events in your city, um, I've been writing a lot, I've been getting a lot of invitations to write pieces for magazines, articles, been, been talking to a lot of reporters. So I'm not, I'm not doing any research per se on the current protests, but I've been sort of monitoring them closely and talking about issues related to those protests, how similar or different they are from past protests in this space, especially civil rights protests in the 60s. Um, and also, uh, talking a lot and monitoring what's going on in terms of voting um, with, with specific reference to the election in the fall and what forms of voter suppression we're likely to see, answer a lot. Um, so that's another piece of this. I think they're really unique. I mean, this may be the article that you read. Um, you know, I think there's a general sense that there was significant white support or, and or participation in sort of the civil rights protests of the 1960s. And in general, I think that's not correct. There, there at times was um, a significant level of white sympathy for and maybe attitudinal support um, for the civil rights protests, especially in the early 1960s when the major campaigns were in the South. There was obviously no, virtually no white uh, participation or support in the South, but there was a degree of sympathy and broad attitudinal support for the major civil rights campaigns in the rest of the country but almost no sort of white participation, at least in terms of kind of active participation in protests, partly because most of these protests were going on in the Southern United States. And so it would have required sympathetic whites to, you know, literally travel to the South to participate in those protests. So there was very little uh, sustained white participation in uh, civil rights protest in the 1960s. And more recently, you know, I'd say ever since Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, every publicized instance of, uh, you know, a police killing of an African American has sparked two, three, four days of angry, reactive protest, but over, overwhelmingly in the black community. Uh, not a lot of white participation in those events. Some, but but not a lot. What happened after uh, George Floyd's death was is quite remarkable. Um, you know, a kind of uh, an upsurge in protests, uh, not just in Minneapolis and in big cities, but as we saw, literally all over the country in cities, in rural areas, in suburbs. And, you know, there, there isn't any uh, systematic data on who's participating. There have been a few uh, efforts to try to collect some data at some protests, but obviously no map, we don't have a ton of information, but just judging, I've been to three or four demonstrations in the East Bay in, in California. Um, my daughters have attended from one daughter in LA, virtually every protest there. Just the images you get from looking at the news, it's very clear that the demographic diversity of these protests is extraordinary. And really without precedent, in my knowledge, 
of sort of the African-American freedom struggle, 400 year old African-American freedom struggle. The only period of time where there was significant white participation in that struggle was during the abolitionist, abolition movement, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. Um, so with that one exception, um, what, what we've seen over the last four, five, six weeks is really unprecedented. Yeah, that's the, that's the critical question, all right. I mean, one thing I will say is that the protests already have had a, a much bigger impact than most street protests ever have. Most street protests generate some level of attention. They tend to peter out fairly quickly. Um, and it's really rare if street protests set in motion a kind of sustained period of significant social political change. And by that measure, I would say these protests have already done that, which is remarkable. Um, again, just on, on the issue of police reform, we've seen significant reforms already in a number of cities. We have a number of other cities that are certainly weighing changes. We have active protest coalitions in a lot of cities that continue to press for those reforms. I think we're gonna to continue to see more of those. I think this is a kind of watershed moment in terms of policing policy. Um, I don't think that's going away. And then what surprised me beyond that is that lots of other organizations and institutions seem to be taking this as a kind of aha moment where they need to examine what they're doing, whether it has anything to do with <laughs> policing. Um, my daughter works for a, uh, a transportation, a for-profit transportation planning firm uh, based in the Bay Area but they have offices nationwide and they have about 400 employees. And when she um, uh, was hired two or three year, years ago, she uh, at one point uh, created, helped to create a uh, social justice and equity task force within the organization. And they had a, one workshop and that she thought went pretty well. And then she proposed, or their commi her committee or workshop, or committee proposed um, organizing a country, country, a company-wide conversation on race and racial justice in the company. Mm -hmm. And the CEO said, "No, we're not. You know, we're not ready for that. I don't think we need it. We're really in good shape. We're a very progressive organization." End of story. When the protest started about a week in, the CEO called for that meeting, credited this committee for originally proposing it, apologized for thinking it wasn't necessary. It was a voluntary exercise. Nobody had to attend the conversation. They have about 400 employees. They got 345 who signed on. It went three hours into the evening. There were people crying. There were lots of, and out of that has come a new set of recruiting priorities and a set of organizational practices. That's just one example. I mean, you can do the NFL. I, I think that's sort of cynical, but the NFL reverse course. Um, we've had lots of companies contributing significant amounts of money to racial justice efforts. Um, it just seems as if this is being seen as a kind of watershed moment on the issue of race in the United States. Where it goes, who knows? I think the big question is, will, what will this energy and momentum, what impact, if any, will it have on the election in the fall? Clearly, if Trump is reelected, there's a real limit to what kinds of changes can take place, especially at the federal level. Mm 
And although, you know, everybody seems to be, oh, well, his poll numbers have dropped, there's all this positive energy, end of story, he's going to lose. I think there's a, still a very reasonable likelihood that he will be reelected because of voter fraud, because of various forms of, what, what should I call them, electoral mischief or shenanigans. I wouldn't presume to answer that, uh, but what, what I would love to see uh, more than anything is a, is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to explore that issue in a meaningful way. Uh, and, and it would obviously, the, the function of such a commission wouldn't simply be to you know, establish a reparations number or something like that. It would be to finally, uh, in a sustained way, um, essentially encourage or force, if you will, the country to a reckoning with 400 years of systemic racism. Um, so I'm much less interested in, oh, you know, there, we need a number and let's get that done. I, I want a process that's going to force or encourage, um, again, um, a, a serious reckoning with, uh, you know, the issue that has crippled our country for 400 years, has really limited who we could be as a people. You know, I, again, I don't, I, 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 I'm thinking about models here. There was a truth and reconciliation Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, for instance, that finally, I mean, really created a powerful vehicle for that country coming to grips with its apartheid history. And that's what I would envision this doing. Um, you know, when uh, Trump went and staged his rally in Tulsa, I would say most white Americans heard for the first time about something called the Tulsa Massacre. You know, it, it's extraordinary to me that that um, event essentially is virtually unknown or was virtually unknown, um, not outside the black community, let's say. Um, there have been so many instances like that. Those should be exposed, fully explored, so that people understand what the history is. Um, you know, um, and, and that would be part of, that part and parcel of what the, this Truth and Reconciliation Commission would be about. Notice the two terms, truth and reconciliation. The first would be, let's really, in all its ugly glory, let's, let's really expose the truth about um, um, American racism with respect to African Americans. It really is a horrific 400 year saga that people need to understand happened to understand why there is so much anger among African Americans. And frankly, why despite some progress in some areas, African Americans continue to lag so far behind that they have been burdened by 400 years of violence against African-American individuals and communities and systematic discrimination in every area of life. So we need that truth fully exposed and so that we maybe then can move to the second charge of that commission, which is reconciliation. How do we move beyond this history? How do we, without suppressing the, net, the, the, the understandable anger, how do we start building um, uh, a shared vision for a more racially just society? Um, <laughs> we got our work cut out for us, let's say that. Um, I, I, you know, I can imagine a scenario under which the current administration is dispatched in November and uh, the Senate flips 
and there is a, a you know, an overwhelming majority of Americans who come together in November around a, a, a very different vision, a more include, you know, an inclusive uh, vision for America. And you have an administration in place and um, a Congress committed to trying to begin to realize that vision. I think given the momentum that and energy of the protests, you know, inspired and motivated by the protests, I think you could, you could achieve a lot if you had um, a, a, a executive branch and a, um, a Congress committed to this enterprise. But we shouldn't, again, I, I, I keep saying if that those, those are the outcomes in November. If uh, Donald Trump is reelected, given his, uh, that he's clearly doubling down on his message of, of fear um, to white America, um, you know, if he's reelected around that um, sort of exclusionary uh, vision of America, we're not going to make any progress at the federal level. And there can be other forms of progress made locally in certain states, in certain organizations. And I think that would happen, but we'll remain deeply, deeply divided, needless to say. And no one should underestimate just how deeply stitched into the fabric of life in America and, and all of us um, racism is. You just can't grow up in this country with, the, with, the, with our history and with on, the ongoing way we represent that history without being complicit in it. So, you know, let's not set the bar too high. I would settle for a thorough sort of transformation of the federal government and a, an aggressive effort to um, sort of move in the direction of a more inclusive just society and see how far, how far we can go. The one, you know, I'm not, I'm not crazy optimistic given what we're up against, um, but the one thing that is positive, if somehow the election goes the way I'm talking about, Demography is definitely on the side of those who want a more inclusive, just society. Uh, white Americans will no longer be the, uh, the majority of the electorate by, I forget what the projection is. I think it's by 2040, they won't be. And by 36, I think that it'll be very, very close. So we're moving in a direction demographically where if we start this process uh, in the fall and there's, imagine two terms where this kind of vision of America uh, is the guiding light, if you will. By the end of those eight years we're at, 2028, and we're getting really close to a point where whites will not constitute the majority of the electorate. As is, they're a, a much smaller percent than they were even 10, 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, when Mitt Romney lost, there were, there were lots of Republican strategists who said, look, we, we just have to broaden our appeal. This is a dead end demographically. We need to open the party up. We especially need to appeal to Hispanic voters who are the fast and growing, fastest growing segment of the American electorate. And improbably, Donald Trump doubled down on the most extreme racist message that's animated the Republican Party over the last 50 years. And he won, quote unquote, he won. I'm still, well, we, we know he didn't win the popular vote. I think because of rough, Russian interference, he didn't win the vote, the, the electoral vote, but that's neither here nor there. But so demographically things are, you know, on, on the side of a more inclusive, just uh, American society, but we, we kind of have to build a bridge forward to let demography help us.
think I would just underscore what I see as the threat to the election, and I'll do it really quickly. So in the modern period, uh, Republican, registered Republicans go to the poll, they turn out at much higher rates than Democratic voters. So Democratic su success in the modern period is really depends on high turnout. And because of the pandemic, Trump and his allies are in an extraordinary position to suppress the vote, to really limit turnout. And they're doing everything they can to do that. They're blocking wherever they can efforts to, to expand mail, uh, voting by mail. Um, and what they really want is they wanna force people to have to go to polls. And we've seen what the playbook's going to look like. We saw it in Wisconsin about five or six weeks ago. We saw it in Atlanta a couple weeks ago. They're going to limit polling places. They're going to reduce the number of hours for voting. And they're going to force people, as the pandemic is still raging, to choose between protecting their health and voting. And you can't blame people, if, if especially those who are older, who choose to protect their health. So they're in a tremendous position to suppress the vote. And I, I still think uh, Russia w intends to be active in trying to interfere in the election as well. So there's a whole bunch of threats out there that we need to be mindful of. And as we continue the protests, hopefully, I think we need to pivot from street protests around issues of policing at some point for those forms of electoral mobilization or electoral activism uh, that give us the best chance to win in November.